Hey everybody, how we doing today? So welcome to the first in a series of videos about the topic of your first trip, well make that your first fishing trip to the Florida Keys. Now I've got about 1200 plus videos on my channel and majority of them have some sort of how-to technical aspect of it. So the fishing part I think I'm pretty well covered there. But I also have a lot of people watching for the entertainment value, the scenery, the keys. It's just a kind of a, a different magical place. So it attracts viewers from all over the world. And it actually brings people from all over the world, all over the U.S. to the keys just because of the videos. Now based on that, I get tons of questions about like, oh, what to expect? What am I going to do? What should I do? Where should I go? all the time about that because I don't have a lot of information about that part of it on my channel. So I figured this would be a great playlist to make, a series of videos about planning your first trip, what to expect uh, through the visitor's first time trip down here, how it's going to work and so forth and try to help people out. So that's what we're going to do. So let's start off with our number one video. Ah! Today's video is sponsored by Jolly Ranchers. It makes you look like you just ate a Smurf. Ah! <laughs> I was editing the intro and I looked my tongue, what the heck is that? And it was like blue. So I was like, oh, what happened? Apparently these Jolly Rancher chews will stain your mouth. <laughs> but uh, no worries. So the, the topic of this first video in my series of videos about your first fishing trip to the Florida Keys is going to be a top 10 mistakes that people make on their first trip to the Florida Keys. So let's get started. Now before we get started a couple of addendums. Uh, number one these are not in a priority order they're just kind of there so don't take it as priority order. And two is I'm going to kind of use this list of topics for future videos. So I'm just going to kind of briefly go through things here, but I'll probably go into more detail on future videos. So just keep that in mind. All right, number one, the wind controls all. All right, and that is like, this one is actually number one. And it's like, number one is way up here, and number two doesn't even start to way down here. It's that important. Wind controls all. It does not matter what you want, okay, in regards to the fishing down here you can only do what the wind will allow you to do, the wind and the weather, okay? So based on that, I've come up with a little practice tool for you. So something you could do, even though you're six months out or you're three months out or you're coming next week, something that you can practice to make you more effective when you arrive, okay? And the way it's gonna work is that you're gonna go to the internet, open up Wind Finder. Then you're gonna find out the local zone that you're gonna be fishing and pull up that forecast. Now Wind Finder will give you a 10 day forecast with a three day super forecast, which is an hourly model, all right? So what you're gonna do is, even though it's today and you're not coming in six months, this is practice. You're gonna just assume if you showed up today, where are you gonna go fish today, okay? So you're gonna take a look at that forecast. You look at today's, you're gonna to see which way the wind's coming from, how strong it is, if it's going to change throughout the day, then you're going to go and get Google Maps, open that up, and you're going to look for areas that you're going to fish. And in combination with that, you can get your top spot map out to try to kind of identify similar spots that they recommend on top spot in those areas where you find are fishable areas based on those wind conditions. Okay, And you can do this six months out every day for six months so when you arrive here the wind does not matter because you have a plan and you're going to be very efficient and it's going to give you the best opportunity to be successful okay so hugely important do the test mistake number two fishing in the keys is easy all right huge mistake all right and one of the main ways just one of many different reasons why fishing is not easy in the keys is this, all right? These are a couple of bucks that I bought right when I first started learning to fish down here. Uh, sport fish of the Gulf of Mexico, sport fish of the Atlantic. 
roughly 250 pages of each with one page for per fish, sport fish, okay, and that is what is in our Keys waters as well. I would say there's probably easily a hundred target species, top level fish that people will pay thousands of dollars to catch just one of those fish there, all right? And we have a hundred of them. So it could be very challenging in that. And it's something that's a major problem with me and that you'll see quite often in the videos is that I'll come out and I've got shirts made of a specific fish to help me with this. So I'll come out and I'll have, here's my tarpon shirt because today I'm going to catch a tarpon and I'm going to stay focused on only catching a tarpon. And then three hours later, I'm on the flats. Oh, where's the bonefish at? Oh, there's a bonefish. Let's go at it. Oh, I should be chasing tarpon, but I want to get that bone. Ooh, there's another bonefish. Okay, and you get distracted and you end up splitting your attention and you end up doing bad on both. All right, so that's a huge problem that you really have to be careful about. Uh, not to mention that out of 100 species, there's multiple techniques to catch those individual species. There's uh, multiple different baits to catch those different species. There's uh, other impacts like wind conditions, tide conditions, the season, the moon conditions, all are variables that have huge impacts on them that if you're not totally focused on all these different conditions, you have very little chance of being successful. So very important there, don't try to do too much. Number three, seasons and migrations. Now a lot of people kind of assume with the Keys because of watching videos and reading stories that the Keys are a 365 day a year fishery. In some cases, in general in fishing, yeah, there's always good fishing going on. But when you're talking about those 100 top tier species, there is seasonality, there is migrations that really influence the times when you can actually or have the best chance at catching those specific species. So for example, a big tarpon, you wanna come down and catch a big old tarpon. Well, Big tarpon are actually here in the Keys 365 days a year, all right? Uh, we have the residential, the marina tarpon that eat off scraps from the, the play table. So they'll hang around here the whole time frame. They've totally thrown out the whole tarpon migration pattern and they just live and stay here and never leave, all right? But the majority of them come down to the Keys March, April, May. Um, they come down, they feed, they get ready to go out to the, the deep water to spawn. So they feed, feed, feed while they're down here. They make their run out to the deep water. They do their, their spawning activity. Then they come back to the Keys, they feed, 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 and that gives them fuel to migrate back up to the mainland again. All right, so if you wanted to catch a big tarpon, come during March, April, May. But it doesn't mean you only can catch them during those time frames. You do have those outer windows that it just gets a little bit harder as you get farther away from that central core time. So it's very important with that. And I would say the majority of those 100 species I'm talking about have a similar pattern involved, whether it may be the uh, summertime uh, spawning by the snapper, so yellowtail, mangroves, muttons, uh, they spawn during the summertime, full moons, out on certain spots on the reef. And if that's what you're wanting to target and get a bunch of them, that's when you want to come and get those. Uh, so pretty much every species has some sort of window like that. So uh, for you making your plans, if there is a specific target species that you want to chase after, it'd be a good idea to take a look at what their migration are in regards to the keys and try to maybe change your schedule so it matches up where you have the best opportunity to catch one. On the flip side, if you're not looking for one in particular, you could take a look at the window you're at and just kind of browse through all the different target species and see which ones might be the, the target migration window for that species and you have a better chance at being successful. So a very important tool there. Number four, the keys. Uh, a lot of times people don't understand the keys are made up of a chain of islands that run for basically 120 miles 
from the mainland of Florida at Florida City all the way down to Key West. It's 120 miles, so a lot of people kind of just say the Keys as all being just one little section there. So especially when you're making inquiries or making plans, you really have to keep that in mind. So I always get that, oh, I'm coming down the Keys on vacation. Uh, where should I fish at? Or uh, I want to hire a guide. Uh, can you recommend one? Because they don't understand that, you're looking at 120 miles. If you're staying in Key Largo and I recommend a guide in Key West, it's 100 miles, are you really gonna like drive 100 miles to go fishing and then drive 100 miles back to your hotel, all right? So you really kind of have to keep that in mind as well as when you're asking for fishing areas, like, oh, I wanna be down in the Keys and uh, where's a good launch spot? 120 miles, all right? You can be in Marathon, there's the three boat uh, launches here. You're gonna be in Key West, you can launch from this certain spots. All right, and then just as much as I'm going to be staying here, but I want to fish here. Be kind of specific because it really makes a difference. Remember, 120 miles, so the more specific you are, the more helpful information you're going to receive. Mistake number five, sun and partying. All right, nothing will ruin your trip than getting burned in the sun or party yourself out and end up with a hangover that just ruins the rest of your trip and especially the chances of going fishing. Now, sun I can kind of understand, but you just have to be very careful about it. Uh, I have my All About the Bait store. One of my three pillars is sun protection. It's that important. Uh, I don't think you'll find any of my videos where I'm not totally covered from head to toe and what's not covered is slathered with sunscreen. And you're talking to somebody that can get a suntan from a fluorescent light and not be affected by that, all right? Where a lot of people can't take minimal sun, but yet they're gonna go first thing is not seeing the sun for six months over the winter and lay out in the sun and just get crispy like bacon. And they're like, oh, can't move and they're just moaning and groaning. And it just basically ruins the fishing side of it. And when you're talking about the partying, that's even worse because realistically, going out and partying here is not going to be that different than what you're going to be partying at home. But I can guarantee that the fishery that we have down here and the experience you have down here, you're not going to find anywhere else in the U.S. Okay, It's going to be that unique, so why take the risk on it for something that is not going to be any different than what you can do back at home. So just keep that in mind and keep your priorities straight. Number six, we don't have beaches. All right, well, what we have are man-made beaches where they're basically controlled by either hotels or city parks. And they're basically flattened out areas. They import sand. They rake them every morning to get rid of the seaweed and then fill it with sand whenever the sand washes away. So they're kind of that unnatural ones. And then you'll have shoreline, which are kind of the rough beaches where it's mainly mangroves lined with the, uh, the bits of uh, reef pebbles have washed ashore and covered in seaweed. And that's kind of the rough beaches that we have. And that's pretty much it. But when we're talking about fishing, I always get that a lot about the guys coming up from the mainland wanting to do surf fishing. All right? And with surf fishing, you're talking about bringing your 12-foot surf pole and launching your uh, eggs, uh, your pyramid sinker with your chicken rig as far as you can out there. The problem with that is the Keys are in islands surrounded by flats and with the occasional pass-through of a channel which pushes water from the Gulf to the Atlantic and the Atlantic to the Gulf. So when you're walking the normal shoreline, you can make your surf pole cast as far as you go out there, but the problem is, is that you can also wade out to where your bait landed and you're going to be in knee-deep water because it's the flats. So we really don't have that type of surf fishing down here. What we have is the bridges, which are basically, you have the US-1 traffic, and they'll have a side bridges specifically for the fishermen that you can walk along and just cover the whole deeper water channels. Now, if you're dead set on wanting to fish the channels, I mean, uh, uh, surf fish, uh, what you can do is fish the 
the underneath the bridges because that's where the water tends to come to the narrowest point where the bridge is and then it fans out to the open ocean and it tends to dip, dig out deeper water where you could launch some baits out kind of into the channel. A lot of times guys are targeting sharks. That's basically which way you're gonna do it. And that's kind of how you can incorporate it. But in general, we don't have the beaches per se for that type of surf fishing. Number seven, the keys are a natural bait fishery, period. All right, the pros do it, the commercial fishermen do it, the experienced locals do it, all right. Even for you fly guys, they're like, oh, fly hardcore, oh, I never have bait on the boat, whatever. If you come down to the Keys and you say you're not one of those fanaticals and you just, I want to catch fish on the fly, okay, your captain most likely will say, well, the first stop, we're going to hit the bait shop and I'm going to cast net a well full of pilchards and we're going to use those and chum up some fish and you could throw your fly on them or we're going to bring out a bunch of shrimp and I'm going to kind of throw out a bunch of chunks out there. We're going to anchor up and see, get those fish to come to us and then get you on some fish. Okay. We're going to bend a rod. And then maybe after that, then you're going to switch into more of a classic pulling sight fishing mode where you're going to have to be very much on your game. Your vision has to be there. Your, your, uh, your, Fly casting needs to be on point. Your presentation has to be on point. Your reactions have to be on point. Everything has to be perfect in order for you to catch that fish where there's a lot smaller chance that you're going to be successful than if you incorporate that natural bait. And that's just on the extreme side. So natural baits are hugely important. So as you coming as a first time visitor to the Keys and remembering number two, Fishing the Keys is very difficult. It is not easy, all right? So you want to start off with the best chance that you can, and that is by using live bait or cut up live bait, natural baits, all right? To get started, to bend a rod, and just kind of get some fish on the boat, okay? From there, yes, then you can start shifting to artificial baits and give it a try, okay? It is much harder. And if you're not successful and you're getting frustrated, you can always fall back to the live baits and natural baits where you know that you have a better chance to bend a rod, catch some fish. And you can also use it to kind of learn the fishery to see what attracts them, where, where the locations that you're seeing the fish are better than others, uh, what the reaction is like to the bait so that you can present your artificial similar way there and then you can go back knowing with that knowledge to try to be a little bit more successful with your artificial baits. But coming into the key, you said, nope, I am a hardcore artificial only. Everything else is cheating. All right, hey, you're forewarned. There's a big chance you're gonna go home very disappointed and uh, it's just gonna be a very rough trip. So, live bait matters, baby. Mistake number eight. Back home we, all right, that good old saying that everybody down here likes to hear, all right, <laughs> what works, where you come from, 95% of the time is not really going to be functional down here in the Keys. The, the Keys fishery, like I said, is very challenging, all right, but on the flip side, it's very easy, and the way it becomes very easy is if you follow the pathway that has been established for the last hundred years, all right? Everything has been tested and tried and there's a very fine pathway that if you follow it, will give you the best opportunity to be successful, okay? So kind of a, a little explanation of why I, I've come up with this. Let me show you kind of the, the history of fishing in the Florida Keys, all right? So a thousand years ago, yeah, we're gonna go back a thousand years you have the native Indians and they basically did subsistence fishing, which is basically catch a fish, you eat the fish. You catch something to feed the family and that's pretty much it, okay? Then in the early 1800s, you start having the explorers come down, down towards Key West and they say, wow, because of the deep water port there, this would be a great place to have a trading post where ships come, can come in and drop load and trade and go on to other places. Then the military came and said this would be a great place to have a military fort 
and they built a fort there, okay? So that kind of started off the commercial fishery because if you caught one fish, you could feed the family, but if you happen to catch 10 fish, you could keep one to eat, and then you could take nine to the trading post and trade it for other stuff, okay? The kind of the beginning of the commercial fishery there. Then in the 1810s, you have Flagler came and established a railroad from the mainland to uh, Key West. So that really opened up the commercial fishing. So now somebody in New York that wants to eat a grouper steak, all right, they can catch it down here in the Keys, throw it on the train, and that person can eat fresh grouper or somewhat fresh grouper up in uh, New York City now. All right, so commercial fishing really took off. Then this is where it kind of comes into our part of the fishery. So I'm certain one day there was some businessman that came down for meetings, had a few minutes break, so he took a walk down to the, the dock, and then just the time when the commercial guys were coming back in and loading their boat, 100-pound groupers, 25-pound mangroves, and then this guy is a fisherman, but he catches like little bluegills with a bobber and a worm on the end of a hook. And he sees those, he goes, oh my gosh, he goes, well, that's, where do you guys catch those? He goes, oh, we've got our spots right out here. And he's like, wow, uh, can you guys take me out fishing? And they're like, what, what are you, crazy? And he goes, well, I'll pay you. So they're like, oh, okay, well, I'll be here tomorrow and we'll take you out. So he comes back tomorrow, they take him out, just totally destroy him, just fish after fish, all these huge fish, and he's just like shocked. Get him back to the dock, he's like, oh, that's the most amazing day I've ever had. And he said, well, uh, how much do you guys normally pay, get paid for a load full of fish on a normal day's fishing? So the guy said, uh, five bucks. And he goes, okay, well, here's five dollars for me taking me out fishing. And they're like, oh, we just doubled our money. That's pretty good. And he said, oh, well, plus here's another five dollars because that was like the best day of my life there. And they're like, oh, that's awesome. So and then he's about ready to leave and he says, well, uh, I'm coming back down in a month for another meeting. Can you guys take me out again? I right, sure, come on down. So next month he comes back, they take him out fishing, destroy him again, <laughs> comes back, pays the money, and then he said, well, I told my buddies about my fishing trips and they're not, they don't believe me. Um, if I tell them to come see you, will you take them out fishing? And the guy's all, sure, come on down. So a week later, some guys show up, says his buddies, he takes them out, same deal, just destroys them. They come back to the dock. He asked, um, uh, how much does uh, Ed pay you? And then he didn't say, oh, he gives me 10 bucks, $5 and $5. He just, oh, he just gives us 10, he gives us 10 bucks. And the guy's all right, that sounds fair. So he gives him $10. And it's because it was such a fantastic day, here's a $10 tip. And they're like, holy crap, what is going on, man? We just made five times our money in just taking this guy fishing. And he's like, can I tell my buddies uh, about this as well? And they're like, yeah, tell whoever, whatever, no problem. So he goes, and then a couple of days later, comes in, and there's a couple of groups of guys sitting at the dock. So they're saying, hey, our buddy said that you'd take us fishing. Well, he could only take one of the group of guys, so he goes, wait, hold on. So he goes, talks to one of his other commercial buddies, and says, hey, take these guys out, go to your fishing spot, let them pull in the fish until they're exhausted, and bring it back, and they're going to pay you. These guys are paying me 20 bucks a day. And I'm like, holy crap, that was like four times the amount of money we'd make on a normal day. And he's like, yeah, I know. They're crazy, but they got money, so why not? And then he takes them out, they come back, get paid, and they're all, can we tell our friends? And I'm like, yeah, tell whoever. And that is kind of the beginning of the professional guide fishing side of the story there, okay? The commercial paid for, but guided fishing trips, the recreational trips. Now they start growing and growing both sides there, but they they both kind of find that there's a common kind of situation between the both of them and that is that when you catch fish on the commercial side you get paid but when you don't catch fish you don't get paid because you have nothing to sell so you don't get paid then the guides side of it kind of learned it's similar in that you go out take a client out fishing and you catch fish they pay you then they give you a tip then they say, oh, can I, when I come back my next time, will you take me out again? So they have a repeat customer. And then they say, oh, can I tell my other friends? Then they have new customers if you catch the fish. But if you don't catch a fish, then they may or may not pay you. They're definitely not going to tip you. They're not going to come back to you. They're not going to tell their friends. 
and it's kind of that same deal. You don't get anything out of it. So catching fish becomes a very high priority. So especially for those guys there, um, because they are in the situation, it's not like the commercial guys, they go out when it's the best time for them to go out to maximize their catches. The guys have to deal with the customer being the priority and they might not be able to come at the same time that is the best time to go out fishing for whatever. So they have to be more flexible. So they might have to change the species up, the technique up, the location up, and there's a lot more variables to choose from there. But it's that same thing. They can't just randomly just try to test things out because if they don't catch fish, they're not going to get paid and they're back to commercial fishing and doing backbreaking work. So they get very in tune to figuring out what works, what doesn't work. So if a guy comes from Minnesota with a, uh, a four treble uh, uh, musky plug and says, I think this will catch yellowtails because it catches tons of musky, so it's got to catch yellowtail snappers with it. God's going to say, hey, I'm in for anything because it might just be the golden goose and we might have it. So he takes it out there and he works it and works it at high tide, low tide, full moon, uh, morning, noon, night, okay? And it works or it doesn't work, all right? And it kind of qualifies on their list of things that work and things that don't work. And then you have multiplied by thousands of thousands of guys that have cycled through the keys and then you've got the commercial guys that are same deal they're always constantly evolving trying to improve their catches then you have the people that have moved down here as a recreational fisherman that are are not making actually money on it but they want to improve their fishing because that sport aspect of it they want to get better at fishing better at fishing so i guarantee you whatever off the wall back home we has been tried a hundred times over because people have come fishing from all over the world multi times over from wherever cities from around the world to come try the fishery down here and they've tried different things and stuff works and it don't work all right so based on that there is actually a very narrow pathway a map a gps route on the best way that gives you the best chance at being successful at fishing down here and all it requires you to do is being open-minded enough to understand that these are tried and true and tested for over uh, hundreds of years and thousands and thousands of professional fishermen have come up with this very narrow guidelines on what works down here and if you accept it and learn it and kind of evolve with it and manipulate it to try to massage it to work in the best of its abilities and your abilities you have the best chance at being successful down here okay so that's kind of the reason why I kind of avoid the back home we um, another example is are you going to be coming down here coming from the great white north there and thermal underwear and, and your sweatpants and fleece top and then your your big snow parka and your big fur skin hat and your your wool mittens and your big snow plow boots on and you're gonna walk around the keys like that or are you gonna come down here and put on shorts a t-shirt flip-flops like everybody else uh, same thing with food okay are you gonna come down to the keys and order the salmon and rainbow trout which is some fish that we don't have within a thousand miles of here but where is popular at wherever these people are visiting from or are you going to order the yellowtail snapper or the lost spiny lobster or the Key West pink shrimp that are pulled right outside the front doors here and eating it fresh the same day, okay? Which one are you going to kind of adapt to? And it's no different with the fishery. Utilize the what is here has been established and you're going to have a better experience. Mistake number nine, watching catching videos. You know where it's all just cast, reeling a fish, cast, reeling a fish, cast, reeling a fish. Fishermen lie, that's all lies. <laughs> Fishing in the Keys is difficult, okay? Uh, if you're gonna spend time watching anything, you're better off, play the Windfinder game. Pick a day, imagine that's the day you're arriving, you're going fishing, wind says this, this is the spots that in those areas where you can fish, Use the top spot map to figure out what kind of locations are the best and use that to plan out your day. 
much more better productivity than uh, watching those real men videos. <laughs> now, if you have to watch those videos, okay, here's my suggestions. Don't worry about the real in part. They're all going to have that. Look at the setup, the prior to the catching part. Look and see what the strategies are. Try to figure those aspects out. And plus those areas that they're not talking about. So for example, when I watch videos, I always look for what size mesh chum bag they're using. Most of the time, the pro guys, the TVU guys, they're going to be using uh, the the power chumming style net that I've got right here, my one and a half inch square mesh, thick braid uh, uh, chum nets there. And I look at how much chum they're flowing. Most of the time they're using the two 25 pound blocks of chum and they're dropping blocks every hour to keep that thing flowing a ton of chum. Okay, because most people in their mind just understand, oh, go out, anchor up, put some chum out in your chum bag and drift baits back but they don't realize that volume matters so they go out and buy one of the white mesh half inch squares they get one block of seven pounds of chum and they want to nurse it so that seven pounds lasts the full six hour fishing trip all right where they're going to be burning through 200 250 pounds to catch those really nice size uh yellowtails or muttons or whatever uh you're looking to do the same thing with a half inch mesh and one seven pound block of chum. It doesn't work. While they're chumming, they've got a thousand pilchards, live pilchards in their chum well that they're throwing out. And then while they're doing that, they're dropping chum balls to kind of build it up. Okay, all those different aspects before they even start fishing. And those are the things that you should be king on, not them the end result of reeling in the fish. That doesn't do anything. All those things before that make a difference. <clears throat> the other things I like to focus on on the fishing shows is the days that are not working out for them. They're, they're, they're days where they have the golden plans of going after this and this and it's just not working out whether it be because of the weather, the fish are just not there, the conditions are not right or whatnot. Then they're like starting to get in that panic mode like holy crap we just dropped 20 grand on today's fishing for all the 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 production people the the spare boat the, all the guides the all the baits the drone the hotel rooms for everybody and they're like holy crap we don't have any footage okay and then they default back to a very basic but almost guaranteed type of fishing whether it be mangroves, juvenile tarpon, or yellowtails, or whatnot, okay? They go to the, 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 the bread and butter style fishery knowing the, the very basic things that they have to do to bend a rod, okay? Look at those videos. Those are the videos that are gonna be productive because you can easily mimic those type of conditions on what they're doing because it's kind of a Johnny of all trades, it doesn't matter the wind, it doesn't matter the time of the year, it doesn't really matter where you're at. If you do these core things, you're most likely going to catch fish, and that's what you should be really look actively looking to do is just bend a rod. So don't watch those reel after reel fishing, those are useless. Mistake number 10, the keys are expensive. Now, yes and no. Um, this is kind of a little bit off the fishing path, but primarily because that thought process that the keys are expensive tends to prohibit a lot of people from coming to visit. And that's not good because in reality, uh, there is one main reason why the keys are expensive, a slightly expensive reason for fishing in the keys is expensive. But outside of that, uh, the prices are basically not much different than what you're probably paying at home. Okay. So the number one cost prohibitive issue is a place to stay or more specifically a place to sleep. Uh, when you're talking a hotel, a motel, renting a house, uh, renting a campground trailer spot, maybe renting a tent spot. Okay. Because there's limited availability, the prices definitely are higher than other places. So that tends to be the main issue with the keys being expensive. 
Now, when I mentioned the fishing aspect, uh, kind of an expensive area, that would be hiring a fishing guide. That as well is somewhat costly. However, in that regards, I would say the bang for your buck that you get by hiring a guide makes it pretty much worthwhile. So whenever people ask me questions, I always lead off with the best option is hiring a guide right at the beginning when you arrive. Okay, so it does two things. One, you bend a rod almost definitely they're going to get you on some fish so you can catch something, reel it in, and you get that out of your system. And number two, it's going to reduce the learning curve drastically. Okay. The things you tend to learn from a guide and by just by doing it is those basics that we have down here in the Keys that once you kind of get the gist of, uh, your future trips that you might do on yourself are going to make things so much easier versus you not hiring a guide and spending four or five days doing trial and error before you figure out one system and then maybe you only have one or two days left before you leave. So that's kind of the trade-off there. Now when we talk about the rest of it uh, being pretty much similar to your cost, we're talking food. Okay, yes it's expensive to go out and eat at restaurants, but no, if you go to four of our main islands have major chain grocery stores on it. Publix, Winn-Dixie. So normal stuff, we get our weekly ad specials, our normal pricing on it. So it's probably not much difference in regards to the prices that you pay on the mainland if you go to those major grocery store chains. Um, just as well, if you really want to get cheap about it, we've got the dollar store or the dollar 25 cent store where many of people will can survive on uh, what they offer there. So there's all, all, all up and down the keys, as well as some mom and pop place style uh, food places, uh, more locals places where you can get a special meal for relatively fraction of the cost of going to a main restaurant. So that part of it is extremely manageable. Um, fishing, uh, same deal. Uh, if you're not traveling on a boat and going long distances, uh, it's not very expensive because you're not burning that much gas. If you're fishing off of a kayak, there is no gas. There's no added cost. If you go on the fishing bridges or fish on the shore, you're not paying anything extra for that. So there is no cost there. So again, what else is there to, to uh, spend the money on? If you're not going to go to the bars, that's a big cost savings there. And it's really not necessary. Uh, go to the grocery store, get your beer or your wine, head down to the beach, catch a sunset, and you're in it for the full experience, but at a minimal cost. Probably not much difference than what you're going to pay at home, but you get to experience the Florida Keys sunset or maybe a day on the beach or on the sandbar or whatnot. So again, not very expensive when you think about it in that regards. So Keys being expensive, yes, housing wise, that will get you. If you can get around that, the rest of it is actually very manageable. So let's talk three different cost tiers. You uh, stay at a hotel your whole vacation, you eat out every night, you go to the bars every night, you hire a guide each night, each day for fishing. Very expensive, all right? Midterms, um, you go and get a, rent a tent spot, live out of a tent for relatively uh, a normal hotel price somewhere else, but it's just for sleeping. Um, you go on your kayak, you fish off the bridge, and you've got no added cost. You go to the, the $1.25 cent store, you eat budget conscious at the grocery store, you're cooking yourself, and again, your costs are very minimal, not outside of your normal home costs. Uh, if you wanna go super budget, uh, you stay in your car, sleep in your car. People do that all the time. Uh, it's not exactly legal, and you have to kinda do a lot of finagling and on the move quite a bit, but Hey, it saves you that cost, uh, but yet you can still experience everything, do a lot of catching cooks, and you're not even paying for food. Um, heck, if you want a, a legal way of doing it, go to the fishing bridges. They're open 24-7. Uh, park your car there for free. Take a uh, fold-out lawn chair lounger and your fishing gear and sleep on the bridge. All right, get a full night's sleep. You're not really fishing, but you are fishing, so it's legal and there's no cost for 
versus paying for a hotel room for three to five hundred dollars at the minimum so definitely budget conscious options there so the keys are expensive yes and no if you manage it correctly you can make it very manageable so there you go and they say florida keys are too expensive look at that 99 dollars the sea cove motel floating rooms but it's actually just this room here that's 99 dollars i've actually stayed there you pay for what you get all right, there you go. So that's the top 10 mistakes people make when planning their first fishing trip to the Florida Keys. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'll be doing some follow-up videos under these topics here, so keep an eye out for those. But otherwise, thanks for watching, and I will see you next video. Bye.